What do you think? I think we're dead meat. Real dead meat. You're dead meat! Go ahead and laugh, you guys. If I ever find a little bastard of business, a dead meat. Welcome to the Dead Meat Podcast, an extension of the YouTube channel Dead Meat. I'm James. I'm Chelsea, and we're engaged, and we like to get scared together. Yeah, I should have opened this LaCroix before we started rolling. You always tap the top. Does that work? No. It's just a thing. It's just a thing. Oh, okay. Like Get- keeping batteries in the fridge, which I learned is not a... Yeah. A, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't make your batteries last longer, but cool. So this week, I accidentally am making this a part two to uh, last week's, or re- the week before, rather. We what? took last week off. Oh, okay. With Psycho. Yeah, exactly. Got we it. did the Psycho remake and took last week off. Uh, I don't have coronavirus. So that's exciting. Oh. I had to go in for a chest x-ray. It was a little dodgy for a minute. So it, it, it just wasn't a good time. I'd, I've had a cough for like two months now. Yep. And I know it sucks to live with. It sucks to have and be around. <laughs> and I finally, I, I called my doctor and he was like, all right, I'm sending you in for a chest x-ray. And it was horrible and terrifying. And like this weird, like apocalyptic movie experience going to the hospital to just get a routine thing done. Yeah. It was so bizarre, but no, we're all good. I just have very bad asthma. (laughs) (laughs) So anyway, (laughs) that's why we were off last week and now we're back. And yeah, accidental sequel kind of to our Psycho remake episode because I am just making this episode all about remakes, horror remakes, but remakes in general too, because I think it's worth talking about remakes as a whole just why they exist and why they've been around since films started <laughs> like yeah. we've just always been remaking stuff yeah I they're not a new thing yeah it's fascinating but of course doing research for horror remakes they just kept running into our dear friend psycho 1998 so <laughs> we're gonna end up talking about that again so i <laughs> it was completely on accident i truly picked this because it had been requested so much um, my main source for this, by the way, is a book called Film Remakes by Constantine Verivis. Like, it sounds so simple on the surface, you know, but the idea of a remake when you get into the theory of it is so complicated. And the idea of, like, what's actually happening when you remake something? We went into a bit of the theory last week talking about Psycho 98 and how as an experiment, it's interesting. In theory, it's interesting. And yeah, that's because the idea of remaking art is kind of weird and cool. So yeah, I guess we should even define, like, what do you, what would you consider a remake? Like, what do you define a remake as? Like a film remake? Uh, I think making a movie based on a movie that already exists okay yeah yeah yeah. would you so but this is where it starts to get a little wonky and this is why talking about remakes generally is there's just so much ground to cover because okay yeah you can you can remake a movie that already exists but let's say okay invisible man yeah we we all have been calling that a remake this whole time especially since universal put it out and it's like oh it's a remake of the invisible man but is it a remake of the movie The Invisible Man or is it an adaptation of the book that Invisible Man was already based on? That book predated the Universal movie, the original Universal mm-hmm. movie. In a case like that, see, it's it's difficult because the, the same thing arises with John Carpenter's The Thing, yes. which is based on a book that The Thing from Another World was also based on. And uh, so in those cases, and and we had a little bit of this discussion while you were doing research. Mm -hmm. Um, In those cases, I think you could call the new movie a new adaptation Mm -hmm. of the source material. But then again, you have something like Psycho 98, where there is the Psycho novel that the 1960 film was based on, but the 1998 film is not, is clearly not a new adaptation of that novel. It is a remake of the original film, which was an adaptation of that novel. Right. So, and then you get ones that are like mixed. Right. <laughs> I, I'm covering Carrie right now, uh, doing all my my work on that series. And there are two remakes there, which makes it very interesting because you have a 2002 made for TV movie and you have the 2013 uh, Chloe Grace Moretz version. And the 2002 
made for TV one, I think kind of falls into a middle ground because I do think it's more based on the novel Carrie by Stephen King rather than being a straight up remake of the 1976 De Palma movie. But it does include some things that were in the De Palma movie that weren't in the novel. So it's like, are those just homages to that movie while being a new adaptation? Or is it somehow a remake of both things? Whereas the 2013 fucking movie is just a fucking remake of De Palma. Man, never thought I would like the 2002 version more. Wow. It, it does more interesting things. The few, I've never seen the 2002 one, but the few bits of it I've seen from you editing it, it looks like 2002. It looks like it, a made-for-TV like movie in 2002, at. yes. But Good God. it does different things, whereas that 2013 version is just like, oh, this classic horror movie, I'm just going to make it with cell phones and new cars. Oh, that's so frustrating. It is frustrating. And for me, the, the audience knows by now my relationship with remakes higher bar for me with remakes okay. because mm -hmm. I am interested in seeing new things done. I think that coming up with the concept for a movie is one of the most difficult things you can do so that when you don't have to do that part of the process, that's, you know, I'm going to put a higher bar on your movie because you just skipped a lot of the legwork by taking this thing that already exists and being like, all right, I'm going to take it and change some things. So Yeah, looking at, and it uh, turns out, and like I knew this already, but looking at an actual tangible list of them, uh, there's a ton of horror remakes. <laughs> yes. And the ones that it seems overall are the most well-received by critics are the ones that do something new with an idea. I do see that you have a list of those at the end of this. Yeah, do I mean, you it's not, wait until it's not, yeah, we it? can, yeah, or it's just there for reference. It's not all encompassing either, but it's ones that I thought like, eh, they're notable. Because I least. have thoughts yeah. on which horror movies are good remakes. Right. Well, we can, you know, as we go through, because I kind of have a just straight up history of film remakes in okay. general. And as we're going to talk about different kinds of remakes, because yeah, as it turns out, like we were just discussing, there's, a lot of different kinds of remakes to the point where it's like, where's the borderline? Like, where's the boundary between where something is not a remake? It's hard to actually draw that line because when you think about film in general and when you look at just the like history of film period, Film is always borrowing from itself. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, is something in the same genre that's essentially a beat for beat? So I'm like, an example is, is Avatar technically a remake of Dances with Wolves? That kind of shit. Where yeah. it's like, where do we draw the line? So it's a very weird topic. But um, if you kind of ask someone what they think of film remakes, what do you think they're instant reaction is i think the general response is oh they're lazy yeah 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 most people definitely say they don't like them they think they're unoriginal but they well, make then stop going to fucking I, see that's them that's the thing is people they, they make studios money they're reliable <laughs> yeah. and they've been reliable <laughs> since film was invented <laughs> but it's also we have to remember too that when we discuss remakes and this is i i thought that this was like an interesting way to think about remakes as their own kind of category of filmmaking you risk essentializing the original movie so the uh, you like automatically prioritize an original because it came first sure just like just because it came first. yeah you're saying people who we you have to be there's an instant there's a gut reaction mm -hmm. to write off a remake because it is not the original version of that idea yes or to automatically judge the original as superior yes simply for being the original and then therefore what happens is you get this film that you are before you even see it mm -hmm. you are putting it in the framework of this original movie you're not just reviewing it as a movie you're reviewing it with all of these preconceived ideas going into it. There's so much more baggage to... You know how the filmmakers could avoid that, though? Not make a remake. There's some good remakes. No, there are, for sure. But I'm saying that if you're going to make one, you have to understand sure, that. Sure, There's sure. no way for someone watching a movie that's a remake to disengage themselves from that. Right. So if you're making a remake, and, and as we will discuss, there are movies that fucking nail it. Yeah. And even with that baggage, manage to make a, a movie... That stands on its own. Right. Yeah. But the thing is, like, 
so often that success, like how well something does as a remake, is then determined by uh, like how well do they realize what we maybe consider essential parts of the original film, like the essence of the original movie. Mm-hmm. I just watched back to back Invasion of the Body Snatchers and that remake is so successful because it keeps the essence of paranoia from the original but does something different with it but that paranoia is something we consider essential to the original if you make a remake where that is not a feature of it then it's a failure do you know what i mean yeah even though it's not a remake another thing uh just with what you said that comes to mind is the thing prequel which I can't remember if when it came out was a like marketed as a remake and then revealed to be a prequel. I, there's this book that it, one of my sources, uh, I don't think it was this main book I'm using. Any sources I use for these, by the way, are always going to be in the description. But it was a book uh, written before that came out. But I think that was in production where they're mm-hmm. like, there's uh, rumblings that there's going to be a remake of John Carpenter's The Thing, but it's they're av- it's a prequel but also they're kind of basically advertising it as a remix so i think it was yeah positive. and that's not my favorite movie by any means but i do think it does retain that essential paranoia same thing in that case paranoia being that essential uh trait of the movie yeah at least does that well yeah yeah, yeah. Even, you know remakes of foreign movies especially they carry additional baggage we talk about that more at length in our creepy kids episode i think part two where we talk about translate or like remaking japanese horror movies specifically and what you kind of lose when you remake a movie that's in another language and yeah there's this i this idea that companies are trying to undermine a foreign version be- realizing like oh we can just make an english language version and kind of like kneecap this other one from dominating the you know cultural capital in the u.s you know speaking of that outrage t- generally when a movie is announced to be remade people are pissed <laughs> and that's where psycho 1998 comes back into God play here it. uh the lead up to and release of the 98 psycho was like oh like like majority of people were confused and mad uh, calling it a, def- a defilement of a classic is this <laughs> quote from the book I used. There even was a website. I did not know this uh, called psycho saving a classic dedicated to getting audiences to oh, boycott yeah. the opening weekend of the film. And there I'm going to put in a clip from the <laughs> psycho 98 documentary that was on the DVD of them kind of it's splicing in clips of reviewers that were all like, this is a, a, tragedy (laughs) my reaction to the remake of psycho please don't do it if something's not broke don't try to fix it they're gonna get crucified why wouldn't they want to redo that one if people want to see a hitchcock film then they should go back and watch the original psycho you do not try to remake perfection we all go a little mad sometimes there's a general agreement that there's two very big mistakes that psycho 1998 made one was remaking such a landmark movie big mistake number one like why remake why fix it if it's not broken uh and then remaking it almost exactly line for line shot for shot there are changes made though we discussed this last time but when changes are made they were perceived by viewers as adding nothing to what reviewers are all calling a classic like an untouchable it's a fixed any change to it is therefore going to be bad. So this new version is just kind of dismissed as a ripoff and a copy. And Which it. I disagree with, by the way. What? When we watch Psycho, I I actually feel like the original film, little dated and little... Uh, I think there are improvements that could be made. There's better Hitchcock movies. Oh, for sure. But yeah. I think a better version of Psycho could be made. I, I would <sighs> not attempt it. <laughs> by I, will, any means. I will attempt. I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> but I do reject the notion that a movie, any movie, could be a perfect thing that with no possible remake. improvement made upon it. Oh, okay. Not I, necessarily. You don't mean like necessarily a remake, but like. Yeah. There's, just, in any movie, there's room to be like, no, eh, this part doesn't quite work. Yeah. Although that doesn't necessarily mean that I disagree with the notion that you shouldn't remake shouldn't is a loaded word uh that it'd be ill-advised to try to remake such a landmark movie i always think of star wars Mm -hmm. which i think they sidestepped with the new movies 
kind of being remakes. Like Force mm-hmm. Awakens is basically a new hope. Mm-hmm. So I I think that kind of forestalls them ever having to remake Star Wars A New Hope. Because sure. I think that would be so difficult. And the other one I always think of is Back to the Future. I have that in my notes. Oh, We're yeah? Actually gonna, yeah, that, that's something I do want to bring up is the idea that there is this cultural canon that we all agree on somehow of movies that should not be touched ever or that it would be insane to remake. Yeah. And Back to the Future is one I always Back to the of. Future is the thing I always think of like, will we remake Back to the Future? I think we will. We'll I think it's see. coming. It's I, coming. It, I, I, again, ill-advised. At this point, <laughs> I think the thing you can't remake is The Godfather or Citizen Kane. Okay. Like, those are two that, why bother? <laughs> yeah. You know, Back to the Future, I, I think... Give it a few years, we'll see it. Oh man, people I don't already know. did that. That fucking it was that video on Twitter where someone made a deep fake of uh, it's it's Robert Downey Jr. and Tom Holland as Doc and Marty, oh. and that got everyone real excited. Yeah, I fucking bet. I fucking bet that guy. I bet. I just watched him. Disney's gonna buy the rights to it, and uh, those two, we're gonna get a remake. Calling it. Uh, but yeah, that reception of, of Psycho 98 is pretty consistent with the reception that most people have in general to film remakes. It's the idea of a remake as a one-way street. It's like authentic to imitation or original to copy. Like mm-hmm. it's just a one-way road. So if we want to understand like why it seems like now we just are stuck in this cycle of remakes We have to go back to the beginning of film (laughs) because film is constantly eating its own tail. Like remakes are slash (laughs) ass. Yeah, (laughs) remakes are just essential to film in general. So there's kind of these three big moments uh, that in this book, film remakes, he kind of outlines as like these are essential to the evolution of film remaking. You've got this early cinema era, so that's pre 1917, and I would 1917 is the year that like that's when we get. I think, like, set in stone, this is what a Hollywood narrative is like. I don't know many pre-1917 movies. They're all short and... <laughs> <laughs> Besides train arriving at yeah, station for, or for whatever. Yeah, sure, for sure, for uh, sure. Then uh, post-1917, that's our classical Hollywood studio era. Yeah. And then after 1960, that's defined as kind of contemporary Hollywood. And those the evolution through those three stages uh, is... Really interesting. It's it's cool to look at what remakes were during each of those eras because they change in relation to what that era is. And, and obviously, this is all just American filmmaking. This is very American. There's some like European filmmakers involved in it, but it's mostly like Americans developing um, really weird roundabout copyright systems for film, and European filmmakers like aren't on the up and up. So then Americans are like, "Cool, we're just gonna copy all of your films, and it's here, it's legal." So, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, the the development of copyright law that literally is my next note. That's what takes remakes from being straight up pirating back in the early days <laughs> of film. So we're not even talking like. Oh, uh, my friend made yeah train arriving at. Sea. I'm gonna go film a train and no, no no this is literally like I'm gonna film the film of the yeah. film it, like it is like it's like bringing the camcorder into the theater kind of bootleg. So that's our original remake because that was technically legal. Or, or like there were some gray areas back <laughs> then. There's two things that kind of lead to this early day of pirating. You have your what what he calls our author calls the Nickelodeon boom. Or yeah, like, that was like Rugrats, Doug. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Chelsea didn't like my joke. <laughs> but these are fixed exhibition <laughs> halls. So these are what we think of as theaters. They are there's all there's a building got a projector in it. We're showing this at this time. There's seats like there's a set time place. Before then, it's just like hey my rich friend has this projector when it comes to see some movies there's not like a schedule and the transition from single reel to multi-reel films so single reel is like your movie is like two minutes long okay and multi-reel is like oh we have to have stories and stuff or else this is boring Mm -hmm. or experimental film i guess (laughs) Most films, this is, I found this so interesting. I never knew this. So because these early films were one shot, so like one take, again, I have my example, train arriving at a station. It is one shot. Set your camera down. Get your train pulling into the station. To copyright these and prevent people from pirating them, 
you would register early films as photographs with the Library of Congress because it it's technically, yeah, because there was no system for copywriting film. And yeah. they were like, I guess it's technically a photograph because it's one single shot of something, even though it's like a collection of photos of the exact same thing. So you have this like, f- like single frame of something that's registered, but. Would you like, have to register every frame? No, it was like just like so. Okay, if it's um like the one of that couple kissing, that, yeah. That, so let's say it's you basically register the image of that couple kissing, and the Library of Congress knows that it's a film, but they consider like the collective of all the frames in that film as a photograph. Okay. Yeah, but then what happens as we start getting multi-reel films? Like I said, is we gotta have more than one shot. <laughs> 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 gotta have more than one shot gotta have story so now it's like this weird oh um, like what do we do with this it's not technically a single photograph but then there's a there's a ton of court cases and copyright law whatever like we don't need to get into that that basically puts an end to that strategy of like bring camcorder into theater and record <laughs> the film strategy of duping and so now especially with the invention of multi-reel films and longer movies, these companies have to get a bit more creative if they want to rip off someone else's work. (laughs) So what they would do, and we still see this happen, is like companies would wait until a rival company just put out a movie and then they just create their own exact imitation of it and the old asylum yeah asylum does it and this isn't quite the same thing but let's say um like, and bugs like yeah it's like a studio gets wind that oh this one studio is making an animated movie about fish yeah well we're gonna make shark tale and put it out in theaters before finding Nemo. there's so. always that always yes, that yes. there's like the, the magician movies the illusionist and the prestige mm-hmm. and that like friends with benefits movie where it was like there was one with justin timberlake and oh, one with like Natalie Ashton Kutcher. portman yeah yeah like yeah, the, yeah yeah like it, that it always still happens. happens yeah so in 1908 we get the motion pictures patents company mppc it's this collective of big american and european film producers that control access to raw film stock film distribution censorship uh they set a standard of interiors for film like exhibitioners which is kind of neat but uh it's it's a monopoly like it just (laughs) is they were brought down pretty quickly by an antitrust suit but it does begin this idea this is where like we start really formulating this idea of a standardized hollywood like that's the beginnings of what is eventually gonna be the studio system Mm. lucy god damn (laughs) (laughs) and with this idea of a standardized hollywood you get the encouragement of economic competition where even though all of these studios and producers are in this one kind of conglomerate this big monopoly they are encouraging competition within each other and therefore they are encouraging innovation they they there's this push for studios to have their own kind of house styles and like making stuff that is truly all different from one another so that you have competition and money (laughs) (laughs) and that's where we start getting advertising techniques like stars and spectacle novelty and genres too are another way to get people to the theater so pre-1975 i'm kind of like skipping ahead a little bit to like just this is just like straight up studio era like golden age 30s 40s hollywood um because there's this con you know there's a constant demand for films and for innovation and people always want to see something new but they also the studios rather want to mitigate at least some risk so studios are turning to already filmed stories for materials is when they just start actually remaking their own films or they are looking for books plays whatever they can adapt all of the big studios and the golden era had their own departments whose job it was to look for books and plays short stories whatever that they could adapt to screen and it was also customary to buy the rights to novels and plays and stuff in perpetuity so that a studio is able to just make multiple versions of a property without making additional payments which that's still a thing isn't that why Spider-Man gets remade like every two seconds? Oh, I'm not uh, sure of all the legal stuff with Marvel and how that works. 
Yeah, but there is always the case of like, I mean, it's the Hellraiser thing. It's like the studio has yeah. the rights to Hellraiser as long as they continue do to make, with yeah, it. do something with it. So they have to keep churning out some garbage every few years to make sure. Right, right. And also remaking something a studio already has the rights to is a, is a less risky way to push a new star or try a new screen technique. So already in this era of like okay movies are a money maker there's always the incentive to lessen risk if you're making something so something you've already made and was successful that's going to be at least hopefully a guaranteed money maker especially if you're like we've got this new star not sure if people will like her let's put her in this story that we already know people like and it's less risky for us and the other reason you get remakes, too, is because film's technology is constantly changing, and that is expensive for studios and the industry at large to deal with. So, like, sound. The addition of sound to movies just totally blew up Hollywood. New equipment, you need new, like, a whole new department of employees to record your sound, edit your sound. Movie theaters need to be retrofitted for sound. Screenwriters now have to write completely differently because beforehand it was just like cues in between shots and now it's like uh oh we gotta write dialogue and stuff uh new stars have to be found because a lot of these silent film actors didn't translate to sound films isn't that part of singing in the rain here's the mic right here in the bush yeah now you talk towards it the sound goes through the cable to the box a man records it on a big record in wax but you have to talk into the mic first. In the bush. I'll try it again. She is dumb. A lot of these mid-century movies that are some of the first to come out in color are musicals. Because they are things that have already been made. They're musicals people already know. Or like, or not, not musicals. They're stories that people already know. But like, set them to music put them in color, we are taking advantage of sound, we're taking advantage of the invention of color, but it's already a story people know, and also World War II just happened, and people want to watch happy movies with songs and stuff in them. <laughs> and like I just mentioned, stuff like mid-century musicals, it's a way to kind of show off, like, this is where the industry's at now, and in turn, that helps make film more profitable, and I that made me think of, like, horror-wise, anyway, that sometimes is not necessarily for the best. I just think of oh, we're, we have advances in CGI, digital tech, cool, let's show that off, and we can have digital gore now, and it usually looks bad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, nowadays, at least to us, it looks better, but like early 2000s when- So bad. Yeah, and I remember at the time, too, it looked, I, yeah, I it's thought never, it looked it's bad. It's never looked good. Yeah, I, never, I wasn't a 13-year-old watching those early 2000s movies and thinking that the CG blood looked good. I thought it was bad bullshit. Hey, you want to talk about our sponsor this week, Aveo Vision Contact Lenses. Contact lens delivery, they are dailies too. So your eyes will feel nice and fresh. So James and I actually both had eye surgery within the past <laughs> couple of years. We don't wear contacts anymore, but oh man, they're a pain. They are a huge pain. And yes. I do remember that when I switched to the dailies for the last year that I needed them. They, they feel so much better. Dude, game changer. Yeah. Yeah. It, they're so much healthier for your eyes. You know, like your eyes have to breathe. <laughs> like, yeah. And the, just the, the bacteria build up potential uh, when they're not dailies. Yeah. And Aveo lets you set a delivery schedule so that you don't have to worry about, oh, no, I've been wearing these for too long. You're going to have a fresh pair come in the mail. Actually, we had one of our team members at Rooster Teeth. We are part of the Rooster Teeth Podcast Network, so one of the, <laughs> the team members helped me out, and uh, Aveo sent her a pair, or rather they sent her like a week's worth of them, so she used them for a week, and this is what she says. says I've been using them for about a week now, and they're seriously fantastic. I've used several other brands of contacts, and these are easily the most comfortable I've ever worn. I love that they're daily contacts, because it's allergy season right now. Oh, yeah, don't I know it. So <laughs> popping a fresh set of contacts in is so much more comfortable than reusing the same pair for a month and I hated the nightly hassle of cleaning my monthly contacts. Anyway, getting them delivered is great too, especially right now. We 
really shouldn't be leaving the house. That's true. There that, you go. that was Zoe at Rooster Teeth. Rooster Teeth. Thank you. Thanks, Zoe. Zoe. Yeah. They're affordable, too. They manufacture and ship their own contacts, so there's no like third party weirdness going on. No third party markups. Oh, and also Aveo is donating a portion of all sales to Direct Relief, providing masks, gloves, and other protective gear to healthcare workers. Oh, thanks, Aveo. Cool. So, if you want to try Aveo, they are offering our listeners a deal for a 10-day trial pack for a dollar. Wow. <laughs> like, that's so, again, if, like, contact lenses are so expensive. They're so expensive that I still have two boxes of contact lenses that I bought. I got LASIK. I will presumably never need contact lenses again, but they were so expensive that I just can't throw them away because of how expensive they were. Yeah, you just were. have to hold on I to them. I just have to hold on to them. Yeah. <laughs> a 10-day trial pack for a dollar, just a single dollar. Go to aveovision.com slash deadmeat. That's A-V-E-O vision.com slash deadmeat. One more time. Aveovision.com slash deadmeat. Even reimagining stories with new techniques, uh, new technology, it, that kind of brings up the fact that like filmmakers kind of like make like remaking their own stuff sometimes. Going back to Hitchcock, he remade his 1934 movie, The Man Who Knew Too Much in 1955, just as like a, you know, I've grown as a person, I've grown as a director. It's like an artistic endeavor to remake my own work using the things that I've learned over the years. Yeah, I plan to do it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You want <laughs> to remake kill counts and stuff. Yeah. yeah it's like, <laughs> you know, th this book points out it's the work of a young director versus a mature craftsman, mm -hmm. which is kind of cool. And also something to consider is that in the 30s and 40s, I remember when I when I realized this as a kid, it blew my mind. <laughs> like films that came out then had a very strictly current value and what that means is that a film is valuable when it's released but doesn't offer much value after that it doesn't really become a cultural artifact afterwards because it's not that the film in itself isn't artistic or valued or people don't like it it's just you literally can't watch a movie after it comes out back then unless they re-released it in right theaters, unless which is they... why like gone with the wind was re-released in theater so many times yes. and why uh adjusted for inflation it's the highest grossing movie still i think so and like yeah. that'll probably you can't beat that probably i have no idea just because like it was re-released so many times right. and back then what the fuck else were you gonna do? Yeah. <laughs> Return to Atlanta. Producer David O. Selznick accompanies Olivia de Havilland, who played Melanie in Gone with the Wind, the world premiere of which is relived 21 years later. Mayor Hartsfield extends Atlanta's greeting also to Douglas Fairbanks Jr. and George Murphy. You know, I think besides movies like that where they have enough cultural capital to yeah. like be re-released, like most movies, they come out and people just kind yeah, of forget before TV, about them. before video, like, yeah, that was it. It's you just, it's out and then you see it and then that's it. And it's why stuff like the Maltese Falcon is remade three times in 10 years. So we have 1931 Maltese Falcon, 1937, it's called Satan Metal Lady, which is <laughs> such a funny title. And then 1941, that's the version we all know with Humphrey Bogart. That's like the, the classic Maltese Falcon, which is funny that the classic yeah, the definitive, original. exactly the definitive version of that, which is a capital C classic, is a remake, which I think is kind of funny. And yep, I have right here films were still released, re-released sometimes in theaters, but most films are just kept in their studio vaults, like in the Disney <laughs> vault, the mythical studio vaults, until the 1950s when we get... Television, TV. television just like f like just flips the table over <laughs> of the film industry. So now studios are able to sell or rent their libraries out to studios to screen on TV. So that changes everything. And now there's this because we have TV and eventually a home video market. There's this increase in film literacy. Like now you can go to the video store and have movies on demand like you are so much more able to like post the invention of television, have a knowledge of film that just wasn't really possible before then. You can rewatch movies, you can compare movies with each other. You can you can have like just a more 
uh, deep knowledge of the film canon versus like something comes out in theaters and then oh, that was cool and then you just kind of don't think about it ever. or you never get a chance to see it again. And that's why particularly post 1970s when like I think 1970s it's easier like you people can start owning films, yeah. you know, uh, that's where the, the concept of the remake starts to particularly get a bad reputation. This is a quote from an article in the paper The Age by Simon Hughes. Uh, I just thought this quote was <laughs> it's just brutal. In the dearth of ideas, hard by the dire lack of imagination, dwell those alchemists of the entertainment industry who delight in turning gold into base metal. <laughs> These are the remakers, and their awful talent is to be feared. <laughs> and also, 1970s, is when Jaws comes out. Mm -hmm. Jaws changes everything. Yep. It's, it's truly nuts how much Jaws changed. So again, if you're going to be propping up your studio with a big tentpole movie, you have like one shot, you got to make this big blockbuster, go big or go home. It's a defensive strategy to make that a remake or some like adaptation of something that already exists. So that's post 1975 we get back we get like a ton of old pop culture figures back there's flash gordon with the queen soundtrack <laughs> <laughs> popeye with robin williams have you seen that i've not that seen it but i know of it weird. yeah it's and uh so shelly duvall shelly duvall who was born like just <laughs> straight up born she was made in the lab to play olive oil it's ridiculous <laughs> and uh superman also which i think is because he came from the 30s superman superman yeah comics? he's like great depression era i think yeah and so but but it's the 70s movie that is... i like i loved that movie as a kid that's like one of the superhero movies <laughs> as like, a kid it was too old-fashioned really? for me no, yeah i'd be like so... this isn't a oh, superhero but when they're flying together he's so handsome and <laughs> like obviously we've said it mitigates risk but also you have to have it be different enough from an original to register to people like this has a point i probably like that we're making this for a reason and also they have to change it a bit to make room for like stuff they're trying to push or sell so uh, another example is the planet of the apes uh the tim burton one mm -hmm. that's like a pre-soul audience because people know planet of the apes but they change the movie like cheap aesthetic of the original too that was a huge blockbuster movie like that was because that's what that's Helena Bonham Carter Mark Wahlberg yeah that sounds right yeah I never and, saw like, it there's like Abe Lincoln monkey <laughs> like the statue at the end I would love to go through the plan of the Apes Me series too. all of them <sighs> so I know like I know the first one I don't really know the rest. I don't know any of them. Oh man! But yeah, I've heard those to, sequels. Maybe get wild. we could, That's not really horror, though. I was gonna say like it's maybe pretty we strictly sci-fi. I mean, that's like hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Dr. Zayas, Dr. Zayas, Dr. Zayas, Dr. Zayas, Dr. Zayas, Dr. Zayas. Oh, Dr. Zayas. Now, when you get remakes, this is when you start to see allusions to whatever they're remaking in the movies okay so that's like a very modern invention is this um i don't know i the the book kind of points out that like this starts happening when we give rise to so there's auteur theory in film which is like a lot of people would consider hitchcock an auteur like whatever he makes you can tell it's a hitchcock thing yeah. and yeah so when you have someone remaking a movie and they are putting allusions to other movies in it, it's because like now film and film study is such like an art form that people feel compelled to pay tribute in a way that like these older, maybe studio films weren't set up to be. They were just like, no, we just, we can redo this idea. It's been like three years and what there's not like that regard for like, Oh, the artist who made the film, mm -hmm. like so many remakes. So I'm, I'm thinking even uh, the psycho 98 remake there is a touch of that when Gus Van Sant makes a cameo where Hitchcock originally made his cameo and there is a character who like looks like Hitchcock who's kind of giving Gus Van Sant a lecture yeah. as kind of a tongue-in-cheek nod to the original. Well, I wonder if it also has to do with an increase in known filmmakers who then inspired a the next generation of filmmakers yes and then those new ones wanting to pay homage and you know there have always been filmmakers who have stood out and i'm sure who have inspired others, oh for sure you know but the i'm talking more along the lines of so um god this is such film school bullshit but like 
Kaye du Cinema, like that film. Oh, fuck. I forgot yeah, all about I that. Know. I just brought you back yeah, for like 10 years. Yeah, I just years. had a flashback. And that's like a collective of fucking artsy ass film critics who put out this zine essentially of film criticism. And that's when we, it's really like peak. This is like film as art. Like yeah. officially film is now art. It is not just existent to make money. This is like an art form. Mm -hmm. And so that's more like what I'm talking about is not necessarily that there's, you know, like admiring other filmmakers is new, but just this like self-referential. Like I'd say the ultimate product of this is Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> yeah. This is what ha like Quentin Tarantino is like the end like evolution of like going from like film as industry to like film as art form because his movies are just homage and he acacknowledges it. Uh, yeah. Right. Just pastiches of the previous films yeah, that exactly. he loves and inspired him. Exactly. I think another cool way to look at remix too in a way that maybe people don't often do because there is that automatic impulse to like just compare the two. But looking at the two movies as a whole is very cool because inevitably like like looking at the changes between the two and like accepting original and remake as maybe one piece of art is really really neat even if the remake sucks but it's it's cool how a remake will then reflect back on an original and kind of make you examine like well what from an original is considered essential yeah what stood out from that what original right. so much that they had to include it right that like they yeah or, else or that it's such a glaring omission if they didn't right so again psycho is a great <laughs> way to explain that lineage it's just another way for me to bring in psycho 98 <laughs> it's so i was dying like i truly did not do this on purpose but i found this book online and i'm like oh perfect it's book all about film remakes and I get to chapter three or so and he's like I'm gonna use this chapter with Psycho 98 as a framework to explain blah, and I'm just <laughs> dying I'm like oh no I didn't do this on purpose uh but okay so Carol Clover a uh, regular scholar that we discuss on the pod she points out that Psycho is this ancestor of slasher movies which we discussed a little bit already but you got Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Halloween. Halloween leads to Friday the 13th. Friday the 13th, just like all the slashers. Um, but all those movies borrow stuff that like are now we consider essential to Psycho. We have the the killer, like the just the title killer is like Norman Bates. And he is a killer where Amer like he's from here. He's not like a foreign, like he's not an alien or, or like a, a vampire. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like he's a dude. Uh, he's a product of a uh, monstrous family, which uh, like Michael Myers, uh, although Leatherface, yeah, Leatherface, Jason, like all these characters are products of their upbringing. You have the terrible place, the quote unquote terrible place. That's the Bates Motel in the house, Camp Crystal. Like they all have like these iconic locations, mm -hmm. the iconic weapon, knife, chainsaw, etc. And the initial victim, uh, sexually active, beautiful, and the final girl. So Lila Crane and Psycho and Laurie Strode, etc. But so when you get this chain of like movies that are inspired by Psycho, it's cool to then look one at just to the like the chain. You can the lineage of Psycho to Texas Chainsaw Massacre to Halloween to Friday the Thirteenth to Scream to Scary Movie, which is amazing. <laughs> I love that there is a direct family tree. Uh, like the name Loomis just like lives through all of those. Yeah, it's so good. Um. But when you look at that, the reason I bring up that chain of movies is then when you get Psycho remade in 98, if you look at the two together, instead of just being like, oh, it's like, it's just rip off. it's not even worth considering. But it is so cool to look at this remake and look at what was changed in it. There's more sex, more nudity, um, which yep. becomes a, that's, I mean, slashers, a lot of, you know, there's, there's sexed up, there's nudity. People are expecting that at this point from a slasher. Um, there is a more straight up final girl in the remake, like Julianne Moore. Julianne Moore's Lila is way more active, more aggressive. She is way more reminiscent of a Sydney Prescott or a Laurie Strode. And at this point, when you're making a slasher type movie in the 90s, that's your final girl. It's not Lila Crane from the 60s version, but it's cool that like that's still an element that we 
it didn't necessarily originate itself in Psycho, but like Psycho really set a standard for a certain type of movie and like essential elements of Psycho have then mutated throughout time and then changed themselves in the remakes while still being there because they are essential to what makes Psycho Psycho, Mm -hmm. which is kind of cool. Does that make sense? It's a little heady and weird. No, yeah, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. And beyond like, okay, how do specific elements of a story change and evolve throughout its remakes? It's also like, how is the story updated to reflect whatever era it's being made in? So uh, again, I think a great example of this is Invasion of the Body Snatchers, which has been remade a bunch of times, but I'm just using the uh, the original 50s version and the 78 version. What are you having trouble accepting? Do you believe that my body looked like me? Do you believe that her body looked like her? Do you think we've all gone crazy? Oh, and also, <laughs> we talked a bit earlier about remakes referencing the originals. And I, uh, so one of our mods, Christian, helped me with research for this. And he sent me like this amazing interview with Philip Kaufman, who directed the remake. But um, the remake is one that's very like, referential to the original and so much that like he was working with the director of the original was on set with them he makes a cameo as a taxi driver uh and he has the star of the original make a cameo appearance as well but i'm just gonna read this bit of this article because there's such a good story in it that actually has to do like with the fact that it is a a remake so uh to start as a quote from philip kaufman he says too often people rip off films without acknowledging the source and i wanted to fully acknowledge the original by putting don siegel in that taxi cab driving them to the airport kaufman explains and I got the feeling that to bind the two films together, if Kevin McCarthy, who is the lead in the original, had metaphorically been running for 20 years from a small place out in the country shouting, they're here, they're here, and finally arriving in the big city, he's the bearer of that theme crashing into the already fragmented windshield of Donald Sutherland. And that was a way of linking the two films. And this is the... <laughs> This story is so good. He adds with a laugh. When we were shooting that scene with Kevin McCarthy, we were in the Tenderloin, and that's a very rough area, and we were very cautious about how to deal with the players in that area. There was this naked guy who was just hovering around the set, and then he was lying there with his head on the curb just off camera. Nobody wanted to disturb him. As we were rehearsing, Kevin came crashing into the windshield, and the guy said, Hey, wait a second. We all looked. We didn't know if he was dangerous or what. And he said to Kevin, what are you guys doing here? Invasion of the body snatchers? <laughs> Weren't you in the first? And Kevin said, yeah. And the guy said, that was a better one. <laughs> we were in the middle of shooting the film. We got our first review. And that was a Hollywood Reporter interview. But I thought that was so funny. But like this dude who has nothing to do with it sees them filming a remake and is like, no, man, the original's better. <laughs> but yeah, that movie is like so, it's so good. And it's so, it updates the central themes of the original so well 1950s sci-fi in general is just red scare shit it's like the commies are coming for us because the original invasion of the body snatchers is like oh man all of us are gonna we're all gonna be the same we're all gonna think the same and and look you know feel the same no emotions no blah 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 and it's this paranoia of like oh is my neighbor a pod person or what (laughs) But what's fascinating is apparently the so the ending of the 50s one is our main character who's like running around. They're here. They're here. He eventually uh, gets the police to believe him. And they're like, all right. The end of the movie is basically like, all right, time to go kill these commie pod people. In the end, it's a happy ending. But apparently the director, Don Siegel, and, and the producer, uh, I forget, is it Walter Walter Wanger, I just remember we were laughing at his name. A Wanger, yeah. A Wanger. <laughs> Apparently, they the original ending it was just supposed to end with him wandering in traffic, being like, "They're here, they're," and it's just this like apocalyptic, ambiguous ending. And it was a bit more ambiguous in terms of, are we afraid of communists or are we afraid of McCarthyism? Where it's if you don't conform and play into this idea of 1950s America where everyone's the same you got 2.5 kids and the beautiful housewife and blah blah then your neighbors are gonna rat you out for being a commie so it's like that movie can go both ways but with the ending it has which was a studio (laughs) ending it's all about getting those damn commies but the updated 78 version has a much more bleak ending and is not so much about 
a red scare as it is about the fear of living in a big city in the late 70s and because there's such a rise in violence and this feeling of like the disconnect of living in a big city where like even though you're all kind of crammed into a city together it can be very isolating to live in a large city as like we found you know LA is like one of the most isolating big cities to live in it's a very weird place but the idea that like you don't really know who your neighbors are and couple that with the rise in violence and just the general fear in the 70s what are my neighbors capable of kind of fear so it's very cool even though it is essentially the same story do you want to just kind of talk about some remakes in general because we're coming up on the end so I know people probably want to hear us talk about like specific horror remakes and our our thoughts on them so I'll leave that open to I have a list of ones we could talk about but well, when I think horror remakes, yeah. there's a few things that go through my head. First off, there seems to have been a wave in the 80s remaking movies from the 50s. Yes. And, uh, I mean, Body Snatchers, Body Snatchers was 78. Yeah. But uh, if you count The Thing, which, again, I feel is uh, in dispute because it may just be another adaptation. But there's The Thing, The Blob. And, yeah, there, there seems to be a lot of remakes in the 80s of the 50s. And... Those, you know, I haven't seen enough of those pairs of movies yeah. to make any uh, uh, comparisons or criticisms or have informed opinions yeah. about those. I do think that society in the 50s is so drastically different than society in the 80s yeah. that it's it probably warrants a remake. Yeah, this book, Nightmare Cinema, that... We have that I used as a source for this also talks about how like by the 80s, 50s movies are so cheesy and like goofy and you can't like looking back on them, they're hard to take seriously. But they're also the movies that kids who then grew up to be filmmakers in the 80s grew up with. And it's bas- it's just like readapting those for a more modern sensibility and yeah. a more cynical sensibility as well. Um, like the thing for example like in the thing from another world it's not so much about fear of other people it's like fear of the thing from another world yeah but the thing is fear of your fellow everyone yes it's Mm -hmm. everyone around you and realizing that you know it's coming from inside the house kind of thing instead of like oh the fear is um people in other countries you know it's like america's great (laughs) now i can see why uh, someone could hear me say that about comparing the 50s to the 80s and say, well, couldn't the same thing be said comparing the 80s to now? Mm -hmm. Uh, Society is vastly different. Mm -hmm. It is in some ways. And couldn't we use a modern uh, updating of these movies? I think the difference is less between 80s and now and 50s and 80s, Mm. both in filmmaking technology. I think you watch a movie from the the 50s, it is clearly that (laughs) old. But... I mean, when I covered Alien, the original from 1979, I had all these people commenting on the video, probably young, saying, how does a movie from 1979 look this good? Right. Movies from the 60s and 70s and 80s, if they were made well, look good still. Yeah. They may look like they're on film. Yeah. Just because it's different than digital, which uh, more films are shot on nowadays, but they don't look old fashioned like 50s or previous films yeah do you like watching body snatchers back to back it's crazy to think those films were roughly 20 years yeah, apart 20 years and apart. like holy shit body snatchers is like a, like the 78 one is is another universe of filmmaking it's yeah. so crazy different but if you were to go back 20 years from right now to like 2000 it doesn't like it's, feel it's you know different but not like that it's, it's not, not that it's not change. like oh this is a different art form yeah exactly no. i do think it's a different art yeah, form like between evolved, 50s and 80s clearly, but... more so than between 80s and now yeah. and then also i think uh societally culturally we're the 80s i think was the last big shift mm-hmm. in at least as far as american culture goes uh i think we're still living with a lot of the, the ideals of the 80s, yeah. and yeah the yeah. the um practices made prominent in the 80s mm-hmm. like reagan's influence cannot be overstated yeah. on this country we are still living yeah. in a reagan world yes we so, are <laughs> <laughs> so I, that's why i would not take the same uh uh commentary on the 50s to 80s as to 80s to now remakes yeah i mean i'm trying to think of like 
remakes of 80s because like evil dead is a remake of, uh, I'll, yeah i'll get to that maybe like i mean suspiria's 70s but yeah yeah uh so so then after those 80s movies i think of the the earliest like i don't know almost modern uh remake or remake of a movie that's not from like the 50s is i i think of night of the living dead from 1990 mm-hmm. which is a remake of uh george romero's 1968 Night of the Living Dead, which I think we can safely say, although it is old, still in the modern era of filmmaking. Yes. And the mo- it is the post-psycho yes. horror movie, right? Absolutely. So I think that may be the earliest that I'm aware of uh, remake of a post-psycho horror movie. Uh, sure. Maybe there are some castle films out there. Well, yeah, the um, Dark Castle, the production company. But it, but that's late nineties, right? That Night oh. of the Living Dead remake was nineteen ninety. Oh, I see what you mean. And oh, that, like earlier than okay, yeah, I got yeah. it. And yeah, that, that's its own thing because like Romero was involved. Savini directed Savini. it. Like it was, I. I really enjoy it. Yeah. I yeah. I dressed as a, a Barbara from that version. I did a, a panel about zombies at LA Comic Con, and I went because I always cosplay conventions. So I went dressed up as Barbara from the '90s version with like my fucking like short sleeve work T-shirt and like a fake uh, vest of bullets. I looked cra- like no one else on the panel <laughs> dressed up. I looked crazy. It was awesome, and uh, Tony Todd's in it. So yeah, points. yeah, exactly. And so- Bill mostly. So then we do get some 90s remakes. And like you said, there were the, a couple of castle films. Yes. Yeah, House on Haunted Hill. Yeah. Which is crazy. I kind of like House on Haunted Hill. It it It's so weird. Like the visuals in it are weird. Jeffrey Rush just like chomping <laughs> yeah. up the scenery. And then 13 Ghosts. 13 Ghosts fucking sucks. Yeah, we watched and it. It was fucking boring. Yeah. Honestly, well, I watched it because I was like, oh, this is going to be a kill count. Because yeah, that awesome Matthew, fucking Matthew Lillard's, Matthew Lillard's, Matthew Lillard's great. I there fell is asleep. the awesome vertical split. That is cool. That is That's the coolest cool fucking effect, thing. But the rest of that movie was a it's good nap. Shit, I took a, it. Man. Yeah. Well, yeah. So yeah, fucking uh, uh, Dark Castle. That's what they started off. To, and then they were like, oh, these are bad. And they, they just bailed just, after the two. Yeah, and then they yeah. just started making like their own horror. So then... We get to the modern brush fire of remakes, yeah. which began, I think it's safe to say, with 2003's Texas Chainsaw Massacre yeah. by Platinum Dunes. Platinum fucking Dunes. Platinum you can't talk about dunes, horror remakes man. without talking about Platinum Dunes. A production company formed in November 2001 by Michael Bay, Brad Fuller, and Andrew Form. Basically, just like a bunch of music video directors <laughs> yeah like we're gonna remake these horror films and they're all bad uh apparently according to at least this article like i don't know if like rotten tomato scores change all the time but uh at the time of the article i was referencing which is from like earlier this year uh none of these movies which includes the remakes of texas chainsaw massacre amityville the hitcher Friday the 13th and Nightmare on Elm Street, none of them have over a 37%. Yeah, but as we often know, Rotten Tomatoes I know, but has still. a bias. Because th- you will find many horror fans who like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and the Friday the 13th remakes. I think... I haven't seen the Friday the 13th remake. Yeah. I do not like the Texas Chainsaw remake. It makes me sad. I'm not the biggest fan of it, but I think that as a remake, it does... It, it's fine. Um... I think Daniel, that it, Daniel Pearl shot that, the, yeah, which is yeah. crazy. It looks really good. Yeah. Uh, I think that it adds some interesting things, like the the trailer with the tea lady. Oh yeah. You know, it's it's got a it's got a defined aesthetic. But it has, and and I this was an article. I for, uh, I forget. I'm. I mean, I have all the sources in the description. I think this might have been a film school rejects article, but the author was saying like. The things that it just does it doesn't work and it it could never work being made by this studio is one they ha- all these movies have a budget. Texas Chainsaw did not have a budget, which mm-hmm. is why it looks so fucking gross. And this remake has such a sheen to it that comes with like putting money into a movie. Like it's it is it is like falsely gross. I do think yeah, like Jessica Biel does not and it takes place in the 70s no, too and bullshit. Jessica Biel does, does not look, not look yeah. like fucking But it's 70s. like so I like I've made costumes before where I have to like if it usually Game of Thrones characters like if uh like I made a egret costume once and like you know like wildlings or whatever. You got to like make 
the fabric look dirty and aged. It's so hard to do that and make mm-hmm. it look real. And that's what the Texas Chainsaw remake looks like to me is it's like this was made to look gr- but like it's not. It's like not real to me. Yeah. And also the original doesn't show m- most of the violence. Like you don't really see- so it's like it's so scary because you don't see anything. But then again, with the addition of, oh, we have a budget and all this improved tech, we can show everything. And that remake shows so much. I remember there's like a shot near the end that like goes through someone's head. Uh, I, I can't think, think that's the head. Texas Chainsaw remake. Are you it's like of, that crazy oh, CG shot. Oh, no, that's in the beginning. The hitchhiker shoots herself in the, the head. Yeah. And the cam- that thing is fucking awesome. That shot's amazing. But like it's you know but it's a difference it's true it okay yeah fair it's yeah different. but and i just yeah like it's it's like we're gonna show you everything in this yeah version can we agree that nightmare remake sucks absolutely <laughs> it's such a trash. thousand fucking percent and like because it, what that movie that does was doomed to fail like that's tough to... well it won yeah nightmare on elm street the original does admittedly have some stuff that looks goofy now Yes. But it still kicks so much kicks, ass. Uh, like, it's, it's so fucking and cool. And the problem with the remake, here's the thing. I do think that, fuck, what's his name? Jackie o, Jackie Earl Haley. Jackie Earl Haley. He did fine. I actually kind of like the, the Doom Guy voice that they have, or the Duke Nukem voice. I think he's, he, you know what? Like, he is in a shit movie, but he's doing a He's good, fully like, committed. He's do, you know, he's doing something different. And I'm not even... I'm not even going to say that the movie fails because it explicitly brings to light that he's a pedophile. No. That's fine. I do think it would have been interesting had they taken the tact of he was innocent all along and like miss because that would have been something different. Oh, shit. But okay. uh, I think the problem with that movie is that it it does take so many of the same scenes yes, and just plays them over and over. Not as good. And yeah, and you know, when I brought up the two scenes of uh, stretching through the yeah. wall, the original was done practically with a latex, I think, yeah. over a hole in a wall, and the second was done CG. There were some commenters who thought that the new one looked better. I strongly disagree. That's... Okay. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. I... <sighs> that's tough because I do think there is a remake of Nightmare on Elm Street that's really interesting. For sure. And like, different just because it's one of my favorite horror movies i don't think that it's impossible to do a good remake of but if you do a remake of it uh try to have interesting characters i also wonder too if like the platinum dunes remake suffer from just like they were made in the 2000s and i feel like everything in the 2000s looks like shit not everything but like big budget um like we need to release this because teens will go see it like all that shit looks so bad. Things like it's, marketed it's got towards two thousands gloss all over it, and it sucks. Yeah, and and if they're marketed towards two thousands teens, it, uh, which we looks, were, which we were, and it looks like shit. It, we like two thousands teens sucked. They're the most miserable fucking people. Speaking as someone who was one, yeah, it's, like, it was it was a really bad era to be. It a just teenager. felt like a dark time to live it through, so and these was. movies reflect yeah, that. Yeah, there were good movies in the 2000s, but movies that uh, I would have been able to go see without a parent, most of them were fucking shitty. <laughs> uh, I haven't seen Amityville or The Hitcher. Friday the 13th, I will defend because, uh, to be honest, most of that franchise is not anything special. They are fine basic slasher films with some of them having some nuggets of joy within them yeah. but for the most part they're pretty fucking basic outside of the admirable kills that they have mm-hmm. and that that remake kind of just like squished that whole series together and distilled it into one movie and was like here you go and they kind of changed Jason they made him like a survivalist and I thought that was somewhat it interesting has Ginsburg. What? It has Ginsburg. It does have Ginsburg. So yeah. that's fun. Yeah. Uh, so those are the Platinum Dunes movies. Yeah. And uh, yeah, then other remakes, other horror remakes to discuss. Uh, I see you have a list here of some that are well regarded. Yeah, Suspiria is one that people, I personally did not like it, but also that's just like a me thing. I do like that it exists as a cool reimagining of something and like is an example of how to effectively take an idea and take something that already exists and like really make your own thing from it. I think it's cool, but I just didn't like it. Uh, I liked it. I didn't love it, 
I did love the ending though. The that ending rule. The ending, ending. The ending rules. Like the whole thing because it's long as hell. That's, and there's yeah. there were stretches of it where I'm like, fuck, I'm so bored. And I I'm like very tolerant of slow movies, but mm-hmm. for some reason Suspiria, I was like, it was losing me. But then that the ending of that was like, all right, this rips. Like that's so cool. Yeah, yeah. I think Suspiria suffers from that. That uh, one character, the the old man. Oh you could probably God. cut him out entirely. I think you, which is a shame because Tilda Swinton does such a fucking incredible job. Yeah, I didn't even I didn't realize know it was her Tilda until Swinton. after the movie. But so. uh, I think you could cut that out and cut out for all the, what is it, the Bader Meinhof stuff? There's, yeah, there's about. a whole Bader Meinhof. There's like a weird little um, subplot in the background that uh, which, I only like, saw it the one time. Is, is interesting because like German sure. like German history and politics and like the eighty like that's that's so but like it just didn't quite it just added too much to yeah, an already it was a lot of long stuff movie. going on yeah but even speaking as someone who Suspiria is probably in my top five still the original mm-hmm. uh, for horror movies great remake yeah a, a great great movie that did interesting things as a remake yeah uh, that's how I am with Night of the Living Dead because I I love the original yeah. so much it's so special to me and like i had just recently seen the remake i really enjoyed it uh evil dead Mm -hmm. i think is one of the best horror remakes ever that it's it's very well regarded it takes you know the bones of the original but that (laughs) that original is a low budget 1980 film and uh i mean it was already remade Kind of with Evil, Evil Dead, Dead 2. 2. Which again, it's like, what's a remake? Yeah, what is, is a remake yeah. sequel. But both of those movies, even more so Evil Dead 2, are campy, comedic horror films. And Evil Dead the remake is great because it's like, yeah, but what if, what if mm-hmm. you took that and just played it completely fucking straight? Yeah. And I know that that goes against everything that those but original that's movies were. Cool. But it's cool to be like, yeah. But, oh, and we're still going to have it super gory, yeah. but, like, it's not going to be fun gore anymore. It's going to be, like, a saw cutting a tongue in two, and, oh, God, it is one of the goriest movies I've seen, and it fu- it's just badass, dude. Yeah. And I love Jane Levy, so. Yeah. So it's, like, yeah, it's it's that's cool that it's, like, it is it's such a weird one because, like, it is the same, but it's, like, let's just change the tone. Yeah. Like, what a weird, that's such a, a cool take on a remake is, like, let's leave everything functionally the same like but like let's just make it serious instead yeah it's so weird i I like that i yeah i I think i I just like the most when something is truly like an experiment or like you know there's some thought put into thought and a little bit of risk yeah trying something different yeah you know yeah uh halloween Speaking of which, taking us to Rob Zombie's Halloween. Yeah, there I I saw I was reading reviews of it, and and even people who did not like it are like it le- like it stands on its own. Yeah, it's it is Rob Zombie's Halloween. It also is a someone pointed out it's a very cool mirror version of Halloween, where in the original Halloween, Michael is like a symbol he is like a, a mystery yeah and he's, he's barely human his mirror version of, in rob zombie's universe we learn everything about him yep he's very human. which is very i think that's a cool again like that's a really neat way to go about remaking that story is yeah like, well what if he's just a person like what yeah, would, what if he's the product of an uprising ra- uh, of, of an upbringing rather than just like genetically and hopelessly helplessly evil and again that speaks to the continued legacy of like what's one of the essential elements of like psycho and what continued to influence movies is the family is like the source of Mm -hmm. what makes a villain and i think it also reflects a growing understanding of child psychology yeah uh child development you know in uh, rob zombie's halloween was 2007 the original 78 and 78 we know a lot less about like what really influences a child growing up and and now we have you know more science and data and we go listen to our episode about creepy kids yeah both of them yeah uh, so I see you do have the Carrie 2013 on here. I think it is the most, uh, one of the most pointless remakes I've mm-hmm. seen just because of how much of a, uh, it's not shot for shot, but it fucking might as well be. It's scene bummer. for scene pretty much. Yeah. And like, I like Judy Greer, who's the coach in it. I like Julianne Moore. I do, 
that is the one thing I'll say is that Piper Laurie gives this very over the top campy yes, performance. She does. Julianne Moore gives a much more grounded performance, and it's interesting to see. But uh, I don't think Chloe Grace Moretz works as Carrie. Mm. Uh, she's just too normal she yeah. just seems like a normal person pretending to be awkward sissy where- spacek is so good at playing like she looks alien sometimes like she's a beautiful actress mm-hmm. and, but it's like she plays so aware of herself and like knows how to physicalize like this you know there's something off yeah. about her it's- and the 2002 remake angela bettis is the fucking highlight of that movie yeah. and it's the reason why i like it is because of her performance as carrie Totally different than Stacey, uh, Sissy Spacex because it's it's less like a fragile like deer always about mm-hmm. to get hit by a car and more of like a uh, uh, she's kind of s- resentful but understanding of her position in the mm-hmm. school. It's it's a very self aware depiction of Carrie White and I really love it. But Chloe Grace Moretz just doesn't no, do it for me. Sorry. I know. Uh, I would be remiss if we didn't mention Child's Play because I do think. I do think that it, similar to Suspiria, it does something different with the material. Mm -hmm. And the only reason I am uh, against it is because of the behind the scenes and production involving all of that. Mm -hmm. Um, I do think it could have worked as its own movie. I do too. But I mean, Suspiria, you could probably say the same thing about it. That could be yeah. its own movie. It's so different. Mm-hmm. Uh, Evil Dead is kind of, no, it's the Evil Dead bones. But yeah. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to mention it because, I mean, I, I went into it in depth in the kill count about my thoughts and uh, feelings about it. Fine remake, just, you know, weird behind the scenes yeah. stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I didn't see the Poltergeist remake. I'd be interested in seeing it. I didn't either. That, yeah, it's weird how, because apparently that one was like pretty good. And really? It, and it updated it in a way because you know like the original poltergeist is all about it's like the anxieties of like suburban mm-hmm. 80s america and like home ownership of <laughs> um, you know, americans in the 80s and then like this updated one is like kind of downwardly mobile economic insecurity and it like did something different but then i'd be curious to see I'd it be, did really come and go. also apparently fucking i think uh, uh uh greg from succession is in it oh yeah greg greg egg yeah oh shit and you know you know there's uh, this there's is so obviously much, like, we running long there's, so there's funny games we didn't talk about how it's the same it's director the same director making and the, the same, same movie same movie i thought because i was like <laughs> i want to at least watch a pair back to back of like remake original and I almost did funny games and I was like they're the same and yeah. also it's fucking miserable so yeah. I didn't <laughs> but uh yeah, overall I am always on the lookout for remakes that surprise me and delight me and I just don't often see them I you know like I had never seen the 2013 carry so mm-hmm. I was like cool another chance for a remake to maybe impress me and it didn't yeah 2002 one kind of did but, I mean, I think the most recent high-profile horror remake, Invisible Man, fucking awesome. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, but that's another thing where it's like, especially when the original is from the 30s. But, like, it's, you, you know, know, it's universal putting out, you know? it's yeah. like Again, it's like the categories of, like, what isn't isn't a remake are kind of weird. It but is weird. That movie rules. It's uh, I would love to know anyone's opinions on which remakes they like and why. Mm-hmm. If anything we said they agree or disagree with us, hit us up. Yeah. Because uh, those conversations are fun to have. Um, we yeah. We didn't talk about a remake. Sorry, there's a bajillion of them. Even just, oh, look, yeah. <laughs> even just looking at the Wikipedia, there's like a Wikipedia page of horror remakes. Oh, yeah. I was like, I oh no, I mm-hmm. can't talk about all these. Yeah, fucking My Bloody Valentine. Like I've covered a bunch, there's you so know? Many, yeah. <laughs> all right, but uh, we'll do whatever next week. I'm, this was a great episode. Thank I, you. I had a good time learning. So thank you for that. Uh, you can follow Dead Meat on social media at Dead Meat James on Twitter and Instagram. I'm at Carebeck, C-A-R-E-B-E-C-C on Twitter and Instagram. And if you want merch, DeadMeatStore.com. Also email DeadMeatPod at gmail.com. Yeah. Dead Meat Pod, Not the other Dead Meat emails, of which there are many. <laughs> <laughs> cool. uh, until next week, I'm James. I'm Chelsea. And this has been the Dead Meat Podcast. <laughs>